Hi, Lynn. Welcome to the Be More channel of Barreira Arte in Diseño. Thank you so much for being here. It's a real pleasure and an honor for me to have this conversation with you. My name is Patrizia Barbieri, and I'm responsible of the marketing department of Barreira Arte in Diseño. And together with my team, we created this channel in order to offer inspiring content for our students and community in this difficult historical moment. We thought a conversation with a strong and creative woman like you who reinvented herself completely would be very inspiring for our students and for ourselves. First of all, I hope that you and your loved ones are safe in these hard times. How are you living this situation in New York City? Ah, well, thank you. First of all, thank you so much for asking me to be uh, part of this. Um, it's, uh, it's very nice to have something that is positive right now, um, because as you mentioned, there's a lot of challenges happening in my country right now, um, and actually all over the world um, between the virus and uh, you know what's happening now with racism. So I think um, for me, uh, I was actually doing pretty well um, being inside. I missed my family, of course, but I was using the time to be thoughtful and to do some creative work. And I was really doing, um, I think, managing well. And I think this most recent thing that happened last week and continues is just um, quite challenging uh, to experience. And just for a little background, because it does apply to my reinvention story, um, for most of my career, 45 years, I was a social worker and for 20 years, a professor of social welfare. And so I have engaged with these issues for a very, very long time. And so it's, uh, it, it, it is a little bit exhausting <laughs> that after an entire lifetime of trying to address it, it's still as big as it is now. But I am always encouraged by young people. Um, young people are what give me hope. And so I'm seeing a lot of young people on the street, young people on Instagram, young people using their talents, whether it's fashion or illustration or whatever it is to take part as activists. So in the midst of, you know, my exhaustion and sadness, the younger generation is giving me a lot of hope. Great. So, well, I'm sure that most of the people who are following us know your story, but would you mind telling us a bit more? What, how did the idea of your fashion blog start and what's the story behind the name Accidental Icon? Well, I think um, if I'm honest about it, the story started when I began to realize that I was getting old. And I was beginning to uh, feel uh, a little less visible um, than I had before. Uh, and it was also a time in my life where I could, uh, I had taken care of a lot of responsibilities so I could indulge my love of fashion uh, a little bit more. And so what began to happen, I think, was I began to use fashion as I've used it my whole life to express what kind of identity I've wanted to have as an older person. And I think I was doing this without realizing it, but I was feeling very stuck in uh, my university job 
And even though my life looked like, oh, I have a PhD, I'm a university professor, um, you know, I have a wonderful partner and a fabulous daughter, a everything about my life looked good, but there was something that was missing for me. And what I came to realize it was, it was this part of myself that wanted to be creative in a way that academia does not allow you to, whether that is writing or how you express the things that you're doing research about. Um, it just felt like it was very old, very slow and very limited. And I had a lot of things I was passionate about. So I had no idea what to do about it, but I knew that I was feeling very uh, excited and curious and I wanted to explore the world of fashion more. I wanted to find out more about it, what it was. I mean, I knew about clothes. I knew about style. I'd been doing that my whole life, but I didn't really know about fashion. So I just started to take random courses at our local fashion school. Some of them were jewelry fabrication or sewing or how to open a vintage store. And in every class I took, uh, students and professors, and let me just say, I was always the oldest person in the class by far. Um, they would say to me, oh, your style's amazing. You should do a blog. You should do a blog. And so I, I realized that doing a blog um, is actually something I could do. I know how to write. Um, my partner, who is a scientist by day, but he's uh, a creative like me at night, he's a photographer. So I started to look at all the blogs that were out there. And so some of, they were very, very divided. Um, so there were blogs for young women. And then there were in that, a couple of blogs that were for uh, young women who were kind of thinking. And so it was blogs like Man Repeller or Garance Door. And although I could relate to everything they were talking about, because I always consider myself to be modern, um, I did not see anyone like me in those blogs. And then I looked at the blogs that were for women my age. And they were how to put on makeup so it doesn't look like you have wrinkles or how to, you, you know, what's the best kind of Botox to use? Or it was a lot of anti-aging messaging, you know, how to dress when you're 60. Um, and so I couldn't find a place for a woman who was like me. And that's a woman who is committed to lifelong learning, who's really excited about culture, who uses clothing to express themselves. And so I decided, well, I'll just have to do a blog that nobody else is doing. And so I taught myself how to use Squarespace. I asked my students for advice about Instagram and I just started doing it. And I basically still do this to this day, but I use a designer or an article of clothes or um, an event that's happening in fashion as a trigger for me to write about um, how I might see the world and how I can view events in the world through the lens of fashion. And so I was really ready to do it, but I didn't have a name. And so um, it was uh, the beginning of September. And at that time, New York Fashion Week was held about a block away from my campus where I was teaching. And I was meeting a friend for lunch. I had a Yoji Yamamoto suit 
um, a beautiful antique woven blouse that a woman had given me from Japan, a Chanel bag, um, you know, doing my thing and waiting for my friend. And there was a photographer. He must have thought that I was someone who was in fashion and he started to take my picture and then other photographers saw that and they started to take my picture and then some tourists came and they wanted to take a selfie with me and when my when my um friend came you know they were oh my goodness you're an accidental icon and so i was like that's a perfect name for this and so that's how the name happened but I didn't really, you know, a lot of the press says that was the minute that I got famous. And that is not the truth. Because I, it took me really two years to get famous after a lot of hard work. So oh. that's, that's the story of the blog. That's a nice story. And what about your community and your followers? Who are they? And if you always thought thought that it would be it would be the this target, or if you were surprised when you discovered. I actually so you know, I have different and, and this is I think something important for people to think about is that I definitely said, you know, when I started to take some classes in social media and things like that. People are like, you have to have a target market. You have to have a target market. And I basically said, I don't have a target market because most of the time that's based on age, right? And so um, what ended up happening was I just said, I'm, this blog is for anybody who loves fashion, who wants to find out more about it and who likes to think about it, not just wear it. And that was my target audience. And what I found, and I, I also, you know, and people would say, oh, you're not going to get any younger people. And I was like, you're making an assumption that young people are not intelligent, <laughs> that they don't want to do these things. And so what I found is that my followers range in age from, I have followers as young as 13 and it goes all the way to the age of 80. And my biggest following is 25 to 35. And um, I, I'm not surprised by that because as a professor um, who was a popular professor, I put a lot of time and energy into how I taught. Um, that was the age group that I was teaching. And so I was not surprised because I know how to connect to people. And that was part of the skills that I brought to me from my other jobs, which I think is an important thing for people to remember is that sometimes you think that being a waitress is not going to help you in a social media communication job but all of those skills of having to really look, to observe, to be able to engage conversations, that's what gets people to follow you on social media. It's you having those skills. So everything you do in your past, you're bringing to the future. And so even if you get discouraged because right now, you have to, you know, 10 bar to pay the bills or work in retail. Um, you are going to get something from that that's going to help you in where you want to go. And so I think that's why I was able to get a wide amount of followers. Great. And when writing, what inspires you? What are the subjects? which are important for you? Well, I think I write a lot about um, this idea of lifelong learning. I write about um, 
you know, I might start with an article of clothing, like a white, a white shirt. And it might end up being me having a conversation about minimalism or less is more or the environment or, you know, in some ways, I don't know where it's going to take me. It, it's sort of like when you go to creative writing classes and you get a writing prompt and you're supposed to just write. That's usually how I do my blog. I have something clearly, you know, I've been writing about COVID um, from a lot of different directions, particularly about climate change and you know, the impact on the world of fashion and sustainability, those two things went together for me, um, as well as writing about my relationship with clothes, uh, because I was not able to go out and um, shop. So I had to revisit and reacquaint myself and sort of get back in relationship with the clothes I already had. And so that's been stimulating a lot of writing for me um, about all sorts of subjects, about inclusivity, about, um, you know, sustainable fashion designers. What does that really mean? Uh, so, so the process is very organic, right? I make sure that I'm very aware of what's happening in the world and in culture in general. And then there will be a lipstick or a pearl earring or something that will then stimulate uh, me to write about these other social issues. So you mentioned sustainable fashion. What what is sustainable fashion and ethical fashion for you? Well, I think that's a really good question. And during this time of the virus, I've really had to, um, I feel very, I, I was kind of doing it before that, but this really pulled me into a place where I really started to dig in. And it means so much more than just a statement. Um, and I think there's a number of ways that you could look at it. So the easiest way is to have consignment, you know, to work with consignment shops to get vintage clothes. And I, why I like that option is because you can find very exciting clothes. The second option is there are a lot of designers that are making their clothes sustainably, but they believe that being sustainable means a very minimalist look. And so the, those are great for sort of every day, but for me, my engagement with fashion is because clothes to me are so exciting. And so what I started to see during Fashion Revolution Week is that particularly in London, there's a lot of young designers who are doing recycling and upcycling of materials and they're making very exciting clothes. And so I think there's so many different ways to view it. Um, there's also designers that have business plans that include them making their own supply chains. Mm -hmm. So they make sure that <clears throat> everything they do is ethical and sustainable. And I think at the end of the day, it means you have to produce less, but better quality that you can keep your whole life. Of course, because 
I mean, I guess that one of the difficult parts of sustainability is for it to match a fast moving world. Right, right. And so, right now it takes time and thought for good clothes to really happen. Of course. And do you think that this historical historical moment and this lockdown, did it change people's perception of fashion? I think I had hopes that it would, but as things began to open up, I started to feel more discouraged again. And I think probably one of the most discouraging things that I saw was the Vogue um, fund that teamed up with Amazon to have these designers two of whom I know personally, and I admire them so much, um, going on, on Amazon. And I think that it's A, I, I have a lot of doubts it's going to really be helpful at, in the long run. And B, it signified the mindset of, you know, selling, right? as opposed to, um, and I know for the two designers, I know that they have been really trying to keep their businesses afloat and keep paying good benefits for their staff and things like that. So I understand it. I just don't think it's going to help them, you know, in the future. So to me, that was a very, and that was Anna Wintour and Vogue making that partnership. So that, that was quite confusing. And I think that some of the small independent brands who really had people who loved them, I think they were going to keep, you know, they will keep going because their fan base is going to keep them going. Um, and then a lot of brands are not going to make it. And um, some people still have not paid all of the garment workers. So I think, and now we have this. So I think it's really hard to tell where fashion is going to end up after all of this. I mean, there were some good things, you know, like limiting the fashion seasons. And there were some really big brands getting behind that. Um, and that means you're going to be hopefully producing less. Uh, so I think those were positives. Uh, but I think sort of a real dismantling and sort of saying, how can we put ourselves back together in ways that are really going to make sustainability happen? There were some people doing that and then other people who were just like, when can we get back to the way it was? And now, at least in this country, what's happening now is impacting it even more. And I think fashion brands who have not come out and taken a stand or um, done something beyond just putting up a post are going to have a lot of problems um, after this. So, yeah. you know, who knows? I mean, that's one of the hardest things about right now is nobody knows what is going to happen at the end of all this. Yes, indeed. So, I mean, changing subject, mm -hmm. um, you are known to have an impeccable style. And by the way, I really love your earrings. Oh, thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. And so I was wondering, do you think 
that what a person is wearing affects on, on the way they feel and the way they want to be perceived by other people. I not only think it, I know it because there's also research that has been done that actually shows that clothes have an impact on your feeling, how you feel be, through the way you think. So that that's the chain of connection. And also there's something called the enclosed cognition, which uh, is research that was done uh, in Northwest University and they did this experiment over and over and over and they took two groups of students who were all at the same level of performance and they divided them into two groups. They gave all of them a white coat. They told one group it was a doctor's coat and they told the other group it was a painter's coat. And then they give, gave them performance evaluations, tests. And every single time, the group that thought they were wearing a doctor's jacket performed higher. Oh. So wearing a doctor's jacket and the thought that people had in their head about who a doctor is, that they're smart, that they're this, impacted how they actually performed. And so I have always believed that through my own experience that what you wear can absolutely change how you feel. And I think a lot of us have seen that during the time of COVID, right? Where one day you make a decision, okay, I'm tired of being in sweatpants. I'm gonna get dressed today. I'm gonna to put makeup on today. And you immediately feel different. Yes, it's true. And I think for me also, I dress uh, very purposefully depending on what I have to do and what I wanna achieve, right? So I think about, okay, when someone is looking at me, what do I want them to think about me? And I wear clothes that I think will help people have that impression of me. So for example, if you know I'm going to speak at a conference, what do I want to get across? How do I want people to think of me? And then I put on an outfit that makes me feel that way. There's a wonderful book by Madeline Albright, who was uh, you know, a, a very amazing woman diplomat in the US. And the book is called Read My Pins. She has a collection of brooches that she has had her whole life. And the book is all about the way that depending on what kind of diplomatic meeting she was having or who she was meeting with, whether it was someone in Egypt or China or whatever, she would pick a brooch to wear that would give them a message. And so it's, it, it's a collection of stories of, and photos of her brooches and then who she, you know, wore them with. And in one story, she, she has a, beautiful, uh, it's a art jewelry brooch. It's pieces of glass that are kind of shattered with a beautiful gold uh, line. And she wore it whenever she was attending a meeting that would be all men, except for her. And it was, the brooch was shattering the glass ceiling. <laughs> so, she used them in wonderful ways, which I equate, you know, to how I use fashion, right, to make statements yeah. um, in the world. And I think, you know, this most recent project, although I didn't intend it, I think the outcome has been I'm making a statement about what it means to be an older woman. 
And that statement is, you know, everything you thought about older women is wrong. You know, they're not going to go away. They don't, aren't going to start wearing baggy clothes and hide in a corner. They're going to be entrepreneurs. They're going to be even more fashionable than they might have been before. They're going to, you know, they, they love technology. They're very good at technology. So I think just by doing this and through the choices that I make about what I wear, I am sort of making statements that are challenging stereotypes and assumptions. And I, I think clothes have the power to, to do so much. Okay. And regarding technology and the power of the internet, what is what you like the most and what is what you like the less? Yes. So this is a good question, especially for right now. So what I like the most about it is that it allowed it allows people who are usually kept out of certain areas by gatekeepers to get in. And by that, I mean, you know, when I started Accidental Icon, I knew nobody in fashion. I, I knew not one person. I'm a, I was a social worker. And so I think the internet and my platform and the fact that I could just do it and no one had to hire me or give me permission um, allowed me to break into a field that I never would have gotten into if I started to apply for jobs in the fashion industry. And I think also what was very noticeable to me was that all of the people who first supported me, who first hired me, um, who photographed me, who styled me, were all young people. And the women who were my age, who were still kind of gatekeepers in the fashion media, they didn't have anything to do with me. So um, I think that was the beauty and the good part of technology is that if you are someone who, you know, does not have, uh, who, you know, the, the networking or the credibility or whatever, but you do have a good idea, you can put yourself out there. And that there is enough people who might start to follow you that will then bring you to the attention of other people. And I think, you know, that's what happened to me. And so it was really in the first two years, I really did a lot of work for free. I worked with unknown designers who I met at market shows and we traded clothes for PR and I worked with a lot of independent magazines and it was actually all of those things that brought me to the attention of a modeling agency in London which when I signed with them is when everything started to really, really take off. And I started to get, you know, very big campaigns. Like my very first big global campaign was with Mango. And that was shortly after um, I had signed with the modeling agency. But before that, it was very much, you know, a lot of hard work, a lot of putting out work that I felt was creative as opposed to just saying yes to things that weren't going to give me happiness. And so I think that's the good part. I think I've been feeling it, especially right now in this week, that once you do become a public person, 
that you do uh, have a responsibility and that, you know, it's a responsibility that you may not have thought you would have. Um, and people look to you to see what it is you're going to do. So it's very hard to have your privacy and be a private person, just having your own reactions when, you know, you have people who are expecting you to do something, to say something. Um, and I think the danger too is that you can become swept up in all of the Instagram and the likes and that whole thing, which you end up kind of losing who you are and just, you know, producing content, producing content, producing content. And so I think you have to be so self-aware. Um, it's very seductive. And I think the other thing that I always tried to do was to stay very humble and to keep telling myself this could be over tomorrow because that's the nature of the internet, right? That's the bad part of the internet is that you're going to just be, you know, a hype, a trend, and then it's done. It's gone. So you have to not get so attached to it. And would you call yourself an influencer? Do you like this word? I do not like that word. And I, I will tell you the reason why. Because A, I'm not good at selling things. <laughs> and I don't want to sell things. And I think there's two meanings if you look it up in the dictionary, which I always make my students do. There's two meanings to influencer. One is you know, someone who's influencing you to buy something through social media. And then there is someone who inspires and, and guides. And so I prefer to think of myself as the second type where I'm not expecting you to buy something I might be wearing. And I try to do my post in a way that I'm just showing you something And then I'm trusting, and I can always count on this trust, that my followers have their own mind, they're intelligent, and if they want to buy it, they will, and if not, they won't. So I, I try to always do things in a way where, okay, I'm wearing this, here it is, and not have it be about selling, because that's not why I wanted to do this. Um, And so balancing that with the fact that I did resign from my academic job as this got very big um, and making a living, you have to be very ethical about it. So I, I think that's one of the challenges. So um, in this conversation, you mentioned creativity What is creativity for you? And do you think that it's something that someone can learn? That's a really good question. I think creativity is a practice. And I think it's something that you can do your whole life. And so for me, I actually do have um, a way to kind of summon it um, when I need. And that is the very thing I did before I started Accidental Icon. And so it really is the first part is saying, okay, I'm feeling kind of stale. This isn't, you know, it's become kind of boring. Uh, I'm, I'm not feeling alive, which is how I feel when I feel like I'm being creative. Um, creativity is usually for me a very spontaneous thing. So even when Calvin and I 
go out to do a shoot because we have a job or something. I tend not to plan it in advance. And we kind of say, okay, let's just go out. Let's walk around. We'll take some photos. And then what will happen is we'll find a place that is just perfect. And we start taking photos and we get what we need. But anytime I have said, okay, we're going to go to this place in Brooklyn because I want to shoot right here, it never works. So it's really a spontaneous process of being open. And if you are too focused, you miss other opportunities. So if I was just focused on going to that spot in Brooklyn, I would maybe miss the 25 other spots along the way that might be better for what I'm trying to say. So it's, I don't know if I'm being articulate about it, but I think it involves exposing yourself to new and different things, putting yourself into situations that you're not usually in, understanding when you have the skills for something and when you don't, and then going to get those skills. You know, like I had to go to some workshops on Square, on how to do a Squarespace website because that was not a skill I had. I could write, I could research, I could style, I could put the pictures together, but I didn't have that. And so it's also learning, okay, what skill do I need to have this creative vision? What do I already have and what do I need to learn? And for me, it's an ongoing process throughout your entire life. You know, it never ends. It's not like, oh, today I'm going to do something creative. Um, it really is the way that you have your eyes open and where you're putting your attention and just being open to all the possibilities that are around you, even in the most every day of things that you think are not creative or wonderful or phenomenal. And, and for me, one of the interesting things is unlike other influencers, my photos are pretty much a hundred percent on streets in New York city, right? I'm not going to Bali. I'm not here. You know, I have gone to Paris a few times and I'll post about that, but my shots are me being an everyday woman in a city. And yet people find them creative. So creativity is not all the glamorous settings and the big lifestyle. It's how you can tell a story that is going to emotionally impact people. Um, and it doesn't have to be complicated. Great. So um, you told us that you took a lot of courses and that you always want to dig a little bit deeper on everything you want to learn. So is there something that you would like to learn now, whether you're, it's in your plans? Yes. Actually, I have been wanting to um, learn how to design, how to use InDesign, because I want to start having a newsletter and I want to eventually um, have some sort of online magazine. Mm -hmm. that, is, that is my goal. So I'm starting small with that. That's one step along the way. And I'm learning about, um, I just got a wonderful book, which is how to start an independent magazine. And it has lots of good examples and people that I can go to their magazine, I can go to their website, I can study what they do. And so that's what I'm immersing myself in right now. 
Great. So um, one last question. Um, is there any advice that you would like to give to our students? What I would say to the students is number one, <clears throat> don't feel like you have to do everything in your life before you're the age of 30. Because you will have a whole lifetime to reinvent yourself, to renew your creativity. And I started this when I was 61 years old. So let's say you have a dream and you didn't do it by the time you're 40, you can still do it. So don't stress yourself out and put all this pressure on yourself at a young age because that's only going to make you be less creative if you're stressed out. It impacts how you think. And then I would say the second thing um, is just if you have a good idea, one of the great things about Instagram or the internet is you could just put it out and see how people react to it. Don't be afraid to experiment. Don't be afraid to make a mistake because that's how the best way to learn. And the great thing about Instagram stories is that they go away after 24 hours. So if you make a mistake, no one's gonna know about it. <laughs> so I think people sometimes spend a lot of too much time thinking And I think you do have to spend time thinking and you have to prepare the way I've talked about. But then there comes a point where you just have to put it out. And when you put it out, you have to let it go. And that's what happened with my blog is that I just put it out. I had no idea what was going to happen. And if I had had too many goals, I might not have seen all the amazing things that came my way. So just put it out, let go, and see what happens. That's a great advice. So thank you very much, Lynn. It was thank really a pleasure for me to have this conversation with you. And I'm sure that everybody who is following us is enjoying it as much as I did. Well, And... thank, you. thank you so much because I really, this was a way for me to have a little distance and a little rest from everything that's happening outside my window. So I really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. And I hope to see you soon and talk to you soon and be able to, to co collaborate more with our school. I would love that. Thank, Thank you. you.